So what I'm going to cover this morning um, is a little bit about, I'll introduce myself and cover my background and why I'm presenting this today. Um, cover why it's important to find out which plants you can add to your garden or any other bit of space you might have and which you know, to maximize the amount of bee food you might be providing in that space. Our research and then I'll talk through some of the plants that do very well in have come out very well in our research. Um, my background is neither in entomology or in horticulture. I actually worked in financial services for 27 years but my mother was a keen gardener and I've always been a keen gardener then when we moved to our village in 2001, uh, I joined the local gardening club, which like a lot of these clubs has an annual plant sale and asks uh, members to produce plants for the sale. And before I knew it, I was producing a thousand plants a year and thinking, well, this is getting a little out of hand and began to dream of having a plant nursery. So my children were still small, so I carried on with that dream. And after my children got to secondary school stage, I realized I couldn't just up and go and buy land any old where I, was, I wanted to keep them in the same school. So I thought, right, I've been dreaming about this long enough. Let's see if I can find any local land, see if I can find someone to sell me a bit of land so I can do something about this. And what you see on your screen is our six acre field, which is on the edge of our village and I uh, was very fortunate. I took three months off work and went and found a lot of landowners and pleaded and eventually found someone who would um, sell me this field. And after a while we managed to get planning permission and um, start the nursery. But I really, at the same time, um, we had started honeybee keeping. And when I came to start the nursery, I thought, well, you know, I've not got a horticultural background. This could go really horribly wrong. I need a USP of some sort. And the idea of doing something of plants for bees um, came in. But at that time, I really didn't know what plants were good for bees. I was a gardener, so I knew, you know, I saw bees in my garden, but that's not the same as knowing from all the plants that are out there, which ones might be the very best for bees. I also at the time, I don't think I knew what I meant by bees, but a lot of learning has gone on over the years. So we started the nursery and the nursery turned out to be not only the growing and selling of the plants, but also because we had way more space than I really needed for the nursery. I've been able to uh, expand some of it into a research site, which has helped me to answer the question of which plants I should be selling to people for their gardens to help bees. And also we've developed the overall site as a bee haven, which has been an absolute joy. What I now realize is we've been gently doing bits of rewilding. That's what our nursery looks like. I have one big fat polytunnel, which is 40 meters by eight meters. And what you can see there at the end is a very large water butt that holds 50,000 litres of water. So we are virtually self-sufficient for our water. And not only do we do the plants for bees, but we try and be as ethical and eco-friendly as we possibly can, being peat-free, pesticide-free, and practice what we preach. Um, around the site, we have also developed, we've put in a pond, which is obviously good for the honeybees, um, except for the fact it dries up in the middle of summer. We've got um, some wildlife areas uh, that we've sown. We've let the grass grow in areas which are wonderful for the, a lot of the butterflies, nettles in corners where we don't care about it. We've sown um, wildflower mixes. And also you can see there in the bottom right hand corner, we have a whole acre which we plough up every year and then sow with a mix of borage and phacelia, which is just purely about boosting the pollen and nectar available for honeybees and bumblebees in particular. It also means that I can feel slightly less guilty about being a honeybee keeper because they have that as extra food and therefore not competing so much with the wild bees for food. Um, the reason this matters, this obsession of mine with providing food for bees is in common with almost all insects. It does look as if we are facing some kind of insect apocalypse. 
Um, I'm sure there are um, more recent studies and I probably should update this slide, but there have been various stories over the last few years and various studies that indicate that insect volumes overall are decreasing quite dramatically and a lot of species are facing extinction. I like this one in particular. In 2008, an international um, group got together and co coordinated the analysis of 73 other studies that had been done in um, tracking insect volumes, all sorts of different insect volumes. And they found that 40% of insect species seem to be either threatened, um, threatened with extinction, but chief among them are the Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, the Hymenoptera, which is um, uh, bees, wasps and ants, and dung beetles. And I don't know about you guys, but the thought of a world without dung beetles is quite scary really, isn't it? So the main causes for this seem to be habit loss, habitat loss um, through intensive agriculture, then agro uh, agrochemical pollutants, invasive species and climate change. But chief amongst them does seem to be habitat loss. So wherever we have an opportunity to plant more food for insects and pollinators, and within that my obsession happens to be bees, uh, but I think Tony you mentioned earlier that whatever you plant for bees does tend to have a broader benefit for a lot of other pollinators and actually I find a lot of other insects full stop so it's all good. So moving on to what do I mean by bees I'm aware there might be quite a lot of honeybee keepers on the line today I'm sorry to say and I am a honeybee keeper myself but probably they are the least needy and the least important of all of the bees for us to focus on. Um, um, have I just lost power again? Have you still got me? No, you're fine. Keep going. Oh, good. It was just my lamp going out, was it? Fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> freaking me. Um, the if we do go there if i do have a power cut then tony will have to rustle up the slides and i'll join because i'm also on my mobile as well so i can still talk to you all that's the plan um so honeybees have a lot of people looking after them and caring for them wild bees it's not so easy to actively care for them and um solitary bees which are the vast majority of the native bee species don't even have a group like bumblebee trust or anyone who is actually trying to raise awareness of them so yes when we're thinking about plants for bees i think yes honeybees because they're out there and they need to be fed uh, but very particularly our wild bees um, let me move on to talking about the research um, i started off with the nursery planting a lot of the things that were recommended online. The Wildlife Trust has a list of things they recommend. The Royal Horticultural Society has a very long list of plants that they recommend. Um, and I thought, well, none of these lists actually seem to agree. Um, and also the thing about a list is you might have 300 plants for it. The implication is that they're all equally good for bees. So I started with just planting bees in my garden or whatever piece of land I have and observing. And I quite quickly found that some of the ones that were recommended didn't really seem to attract a lot of bees at all. And I thought, well, this is no good. We need something a little bit more scientific. And about that time, I found that the apiculture um, unit within Sussex University was doing something um, to try and count bees in a more systematic basis and they'd set up one meter plot somewhere on the university campus only 16 of them or something i think it was 16 lavenders and 16 other plants and i went along and did a workshop with them and understood their methodology and then i thought okay they're coming at it they don't they're not gardeners they've come at it from an apiculture a bee perspective what i quickly realized was that although i liked their methodology they hadn't taken everything into account so I've then evolved it a little bit since then but what I do is really very simple and anybody could replicate it if they've just got the time and the determination to do it 
I plant each plant that I'm testing in a square meter of ground. I then wait a year or sometimes three years for that plant to mature so that the square meter is pretty much full. Then every week when that plant is in flower, I will come out on a day when it's you know, a good day for bees to be flying when it's not blowing a gale or uh, raining or freezing. And I will very quickly, on each square meter, do a quick right, snapshot count. What's on those plants right now? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, okay, three of them seem to be bumblebees, two of them seem to be solitary bees. And where I can, I'll identify the species of bumblebee because at that speed, you can pretty much do that, not so much with the solitary bees. Um, I note the other bits of data about the weather and off we go. I've now been doing that systematically for six years and I have tested 117 plants and I'm very pleased to say that last year my paper was also co-authored and published um, in a scientific journal with Professor Dave Gulson from Sussex University. Um, now I just add the odd plant every now and again, but I'm not in full study mode. But anyway, that's a picture of the research bed. It is all in square meters. You can just see that it's sort of clumps and patches, but I think it still looks quite pretty. It's still a great big herbaceous border to me as well, and still a joy. Uh, moving on, let me see what I found. Firstly, some attract, some bees, at any one given time attract a lot more, some plants rather, not bees, some plants attract a lot more bees than others. Bear in mind, I was only focusing on plants that were actually recommended to be attractive to bees in the first place. This is just the top 30. And you can see this is just at any, what, at, at any one time, what's the average number of bees per square meter that I'm seeing on plants. And up at the top, very quickly you see you've got a sedum spectabile which flowers in September and Helenia mortinale that flowers sort of August time. But that's only one factor because some plants flower for a very much longer time. So again this is a, a top 30 by flowering times and along the top here you've got the uh, weeks of the year starting from week nine in, which is sometime at the end of March and going through to week 40 which is in beginning end of September beginning of October and you see at the top you've got a rhizomum bowls mauve that if you any of you've ever grown it in your gardens you'll know it never seems to actually stop flowering it just goes on and on and on so there's something here if you are trying to get the maximum amount of food out of a square meter of ground do you want a plant that attracts 30 bees at any one time, but only flowers for two weeks? Or do you want a plant that only attracts one bee at a time, but flowers for 30 weeks? So my logic was just simply to multiply those two figures. How many weeks does the plant flower for? And how many bees on average does that plant attract at any one time? And we end up with a ranking. The first thing to note, and this is again, is top 30s, but you know, if this is the top 30 ranked plants, having selected them initially from plants that are likely to be highly attractive to bees in the first place, then if you can imagine by the time you get down to 117, the numbers get quite small. And then when you get into plants that don't seem to be very attractive <clears throat> to bees at all, it gets less and less and less. Um, really, the number of plant uh, bees that any plant attracts is not equal. So this is a main failing of all the lists of recommendations. They really are not equal. And I have to conclude that the bees are not stupid and they're visiting plants because they get a worthwhile reward. So. If they are visiting a plant more frequently, it's got to be because there is food available for them and therefore it is producing more food. The other thing to note about this chart is that I've also broken it down into three very rough groups of blue is for honeybees, red is bumblebees, and green is solitary bees. 
and you will see just even amongst this top 30 that the proportion of bees attracted on each type of plant varies considerably. The geranium rosanne at the top is more than 50% attracting solitary bees, where the calament directly below it is about 70% honeybees. And so it carries on. The top two, that geranium rosanne and the calament, this is what they look like. Interestingly, geranium rosanne and going back a few slides, the Arismon Bowls mauve that flowers forever have one thing in common. They are both sterile. It is not true that some manufactured, highly bred plants are not good for pollinators. The thing about them though is they've, as they've been bred, they've been bred to flower longer and longer because it's beneficial aesthetically in the garden. But what the breeders didn't realize was happening um, was they've actually bred plants that can produce nectar but cannot produce pollen and therefore cannot set seed. So from the plant's perspective, um, it just keeps trying to flower and keeps trying to set seed because no one's told it it can't. So, you know, geranium rosanne will start quite tidy in a ball and by September, when it's just about exhausted itself, three plants have actually spread out of their square meter and are now covering about three square meters as it sends its arms longer and longer, producing more and more flowers. A little bit similar with the Arismon Bowls mauve, which tends to end up going a bit lank and uh, woody. Calamint, on the other hand, is a completely sensible, normal plant that can produce seed and is completely viable, just produces an awful lot of these tiny little white mauve flowers. So there is more about my research if you want to visit my website and I'll give you the details of that at the end. And there is a full scientific paper and there are a few more sort of sub points that I found. But that's actually, in a nutshell, the main things that I've found. And these are the conclusions. The conclusions are that the number of bees that are attracted to different plants varies greatly. But there's an awful lot we still need to know about why. Um, different plants, and I'll come on to this in a second, can actually, different plants that look very similar uh, can still attract different bees, which is quite strange. Weather has a huge influence. Honey beekeepers will know this, the, you know, if the weather is poor, it has the impact on the honey. Well, obviously it has the impact on the, on the numbers of bees of all types that are turning up on the plants as well. And for the gardeners who might be listening, you'll be pleased to know that some of the gardening truths still hold out, which is that a healthy plant will attract more bees than an unhealthy plant. So even though I have a ranking, if that plant doesn't grow well, a plant you know near the top and you wanted to buy it and plant it if it doesn't grow well in your soil then it's not going to attract as many bees um there is one point i would like to say about honeybees versus wild bees and i can't prove this and in fact i know there's a lot of studies that are looking at it but no one's conclusively proven it yet but i do feel there are indications in my research that sadly Honeybees have a negative impact on wild bees. What I actually observe is that a plant will begin to flower and it's popular with bumblebees or solitary bees. And then as it comes into full flower, if honeybees decide that that's a good plant for them, they will descend somewhat more panded and they don't actively attack or push other bees out but they will simply arrive in such numbers that they're just more efficient than the other bees that might bumble around and find the food and go on to another plant. Honeybees will just make a beeline, excuse the pun, for it, um, and basically consume all the food resources before others get a look in. So for the honeybee keepers, do consider when you're adding more hives whether or not there is enough food in the local area to support them. A couple of myths I'd like to bust. Bees need native plants. Well, I think it's true that certainly butterflies need native plants because their larva 
uh, and caterpillars need have uh, co um, need to coexist with specific plants, but bees are not that fussy. Bees need open plants in some cases, but not all. And bees attracted to blue flowers. Definitely not convinced by that one. I'll move on. This is a chart that shows native bees versus non-native bees attracted to the whole of my research bed again through the weeks in the year, starting with week nine on the left hand side and going to week 42 on the right. And you will see that for the most part, the num number of bees per square meter in any given week is the same for the native and the non-native plants, showing that the bees as a totality really don't care, except for the early parts of the year and possibly slightly lesser extent at the far ends of the year. The differences at the two ends of the year is that our native plants don't tend to start flowering until May. But if I go back to the example of Erismum bowls mauve, well, Erismums come from Greece and they, you know, they flower halfway up a Greek mountain somewhere. And no one's told them that they're now in the UK. So they are responding to the light. And when the light levels say it's March, they start flowering, regardless of what the weather is doing. So non-native plants are very good at extending the season for bees at each end. But in the middle, the bees show that they don't care. Open flowers, it is commonly said, and I even hear Monty Don and people say it on the telly on gardening programs, um, that bees need an open, simple flower. Well, I'm showing this picture here of uh, Centauria dilbata, and you can see it's a really complex flower for a bee to get its head into. But I'm also showing you that this leaf cutter bee doesn't care at all. It just forces its head down between all the fluffy bits and, and gets the nectar. And my observations are that only honeybees are the ones that need open flowers. But I think because in our language, we tend to use the term bees often to mean honeybees. In other words, if you consider the term beekeepers, it's not accurate. We should be described ourselves as honey beekeepers. But because that confusion of the language between the word honeybee and bee, when people say bees mean open flowers, I think they mean honeybees because it's definitely not my observation that it's other bees that need poor honeybees, short little tongues and not much perseverance to get into those kind of flowers. There is something about tongue length. Different plants have different nectary tube lengths and therefore tongue lengths matter a lot when you're trying to access the food in plants. However, it's not always what you think and it's not always tongue length. Sometimes it can be the absolute size of the bee. This is a picture of some trailing lobelia in a pot outside my back door here. And although the flower looks quite large in the picture, most of you will know what lobelia looks like. It's a mass of tiny flowers. So each one of those flowers is only a centimeter across. And what you see there is a small lassioglossum solitary bee not just sticking its tongue in, but it's sticking its whole head and shoulders down into the nectary tube. And I don't find that it's long-tongued bumblebees sticking their tongues down into those tubes. I find it's always the lassioglossums who are small enough to crawl inside that are pollinating those plants. But there is still more to learn about why different plants attract bees. This is a chart that shows my data for four different yellow daisies. And superficially, these daisies all look very structurally similar. They are all about 10 centimeters across in their flowers and their petals, and the cones in the center are each about three or four centimeters across, very similar in their dimensions. And they are that classic open flower that's meant to be attractive to short-tongued bees. So, but you can see here, the Anthemus tinctoria is only really attracting solitary bees, where the Heleniums, of which I've got two there at the bottom, are mostly attracting honeybees. We have no explanation yet for this, and there's more studies to do on it. When Dave Golson looked at my data, 
he is a bumblebee expert. In fact, he's um, founder of the Bumblebee Trust. He, off the top of his head, knew there was something very strange when he looked at the data because he realized that even bumblebees themselves have a variety of tongue lengths and he knew what all the tongue lengths were of the bumblebees. So he looked at my data and he realized that he was very surprised to find that different bumblebees were attracted to different um, flowers, even though he thought they should all be bumblebees of exactly the same tongue, tongue length, logically would all be attracted to the same flower. He found that wasn't true. So we think that different bees have a prepper, uh, have also have preferences for the profile of the sugars within the nectar. So all nectar is a mixture of fructose, glucose, and what's the other one? Can't remember, but they've got a different profile. So different bees may be attracted to different sugar profiles. Blue flowers. I'm using this chart again because when I made it, I actually put, well, to the extent that Excel could support the colors, I put the approximate flower color in. And as you see, yes, there are quite a lot of blue flowers, but then I think I have quite a lot of blue flowers. Um, but it's definitely not true that bees are predominantly extract, uh, attracted to them. As you go through the seasons, I find I have a lot of blue and purple things that are in flower at the minute. And then later in the season, uh, my plants go very much more to sort of the red and yellow spectrum. And that's very typical in most gardens. And August, is probably the peak time for um, bee numbers in my research bed. And that is dominated by reds and yellows when we get to that stage. All of the plants that you might be planting in your garden are really compensating for the lack of food that is growing in the natural environment. And the natural cycle, as all beekeepers will know, is trees in spring followed by shrubs and then eventually on to July onwards where there would have been herbaceous perennials in meadows and yes we do also benefit from some crops that have taken up the area but not so much. Herbaceous perennials are the main thing that we have lost in our environment 97% of meadows or something crazy so really that's the thing that your gardens are replicating. Yes, if you can put in a great big goat willow in your garden, off you go, but not many people have got gardens that big. But herbaceous perennials and flower beds and having the food from, well, May onwards is very, very important. I'm now gonna come on briefly to talk about, thank you, uh, to talk about the best plants by bee type, because I know some people are interested specifically in honeybees and other people are interested in bumblebees or solitary bees. I'm just gonna do the top few. Honeybees, Helenia autumnale, which is this wonderful American prairie daisy, um, seems to attract the most honeybees, but it also attracts quite a lot of small solitary bees. And I was lucky enough last year to spot, I don't know if you can see, there's a sharp tail bee, um, which is a, a solitary bee but also a cuckoo solitary bee quite exciting to find that in the garden um, all heleniums are good for bees but this one happens to be uh, a true species one and is viable from seed and has a lot more smaller flowers so it's less flashy but has a lot more flowers and that's why it attracts the most of all the heleniums oregonum also Good old oregonum. Most people have it in a herb patch in their gardens, but whether or not you let it flower is another matter. If you do let it flower, not only is it fantastic for bees, but you get an awful lot of butterflies as well. I happen to be showing a cuckoo bumblebee there, but I don't know why I need a photograph of a honeybee, don't I? But it's mostly honeybees. Teucrium. Teucrium hercanicum is a plant you very rarely see in garden centres, and I don't know why, because it's a very well be behaved herbaceous perennial. I've had the same six plants that have clumped up and filled their square meter. I've had them in the ground for seven years and I've never even lifted them or split them or replaced them or anything. Just clumps up, flowers beautifully, about sort of thigh high flowers that look these lovely deep pink spires. No idea why garden centers don't grow, possibly because it doesn't die and they can't sell you another one. And sedum. 
of all of the honeybee attracting plants, this Sedum spectabile attracts the most. On a good year, the peak year, I had to get my son to come and help me count the bees on these plants. And after we'd spent 10 minutes doing it between us, dividing the clump between us and going, you count that half, I'll count this, and then take an average, we found 107 honeybees on average on a single square meter of sedums. The reason this is not the top performing plant is because it is a lonely flower for three weeks. But in that three weeks, boy, does it attract a lot of honeybees. And it flowers August, September, which is also, I think, a very useful time for honeybees. Moving on to bumblebees. Echium vulgari, Vipris bugloss. This is a native wildflower, but I find it also performs very well as a garden plant. It does seed itself about, but nothing particularly seriously. First year, the reason garden centers don't sell this is first year, it produced a rosette of thistles leaves that look absolutely terrible. And unless you know what it is, you would weed it out pretty quickly. And then year two, up come these beautiful blue, deep blue spires that are sort of waist high on a good year. They've had plenty of rain. And each plant will produce seven or eight of these spires. Wonderful, absolutely stunning. It's a chalk downland native, but I have it growing in heavy clay and it's perfectly happy. It seems quite happy. Hyssop. Hyssop is technically a herb, but I think is actually an equivalent to lavender. It produces nice little tidy shrubby balls. You can use it as a sort of edge of a border, but unlike lavender, you can cut it back really hard so it can keep going for years and years and years. And unlike lavender, it flowers for about 10 weeks, where most lavenders only flower for about three or four if you're lucky. Good little thing. Cat mint. Gotta have cat mint in the garden, say no more. Unless you've got, unless you really hate cats, of course, because it does attract them too. Now I mentioned lavenders before. There is one type of lavender, and it's the ones I sell, that actually flower longer. And again, it's the growers have done that trick of making them sterile by accident. And these are the ones that are named with an X intermedia. The X intermedia varieties are almost all a crossbreed that is now um, infertile, but still produces nectar. So if you're gonna grow lavender, go for an X intermediate variety. Solitary bees. Now this is a difficult group for recommending plants for because solitary bees, 225 odd species, is not one thing. And they are very different in their tastes. But just based on the statistics, Anthemus tinctoria, Beautiful yellow daisy, there you go, that's what it looks like. And there we have with, well, I don't know if I've got four species, I think I've got three species of solitary bee there. I think the top two are both flavipes, male and female. Wonderful for attracting solitary bees. And I don't know if a lot of you have grown lamb's ears. I find lamb's ear fascinating, not just as a plant, but it particularly attracts the solitary bee, the wool carder bee. So on a sunny day, and I've been doing it this week, if you have the time to sit and watch a clamp of Stachyx byzantina, lamb's ears, if you're lucky, you'll have a wool carder bee male that takes up residence. They're very territorial. And if you have one, he'll spend the entire summer just defending this patch of lamb's ears and even will fight off bumblebees that are twice his size and why does he do this? Well, because he knows the girls are attracted to the hairs on the leaves and they will actually scrape them off and use the hairs to line their tubular nests where they lay their eggs. And he's waiting for the girls to turn up so he can jump on them. It's that simple. So you get to watch war and sex in your flower beds if you have Stachys byzantina. And this week I've been particularly enjoying it because we've got two male solitary bees competing for territory. And so it's almost like rutting stags. You see them hovering in the flower bed about six inches apart and staring at each other and trying to psych each other out and then they'll attack. And because they've got slightly different patterns, I can tell which one's which and there is one slightly larger and guess what, he always wins. But the other one's still trying. It's really amusing. And then 
I think this is my final one, yes. Um, Eryngium planum, a really good species of Eryngium. Lots and lots of these still blue balls from about August onwards. Doesn't just attract bees, attracts everything. Wasps, flies, hoverflies, butterflies, you name it. Eryngium planum attracts it in large numbers. The whole thing can be really, truly buzzing and shaking with insects, amazing. The garden centres have been selling a lot of eryngiums in the last few years that have been highly bred to be have bigger, bluer balls or bigger, spikier bracts that look very dramatic, but are neither as good as a garden plant. In fact, I think they rot off in winter quite readily or attract as many insects. Again, it's a story of more, more smaller flowers rather than fewer, more dramatic ones wins out for pollinators every time. So in summary of what you can do to attract more bees into your garden, other than obviously plant the right plants, is aim for as much as you can between May and October. Stuff the plants in as many as you can. And by the way, by stuffing more plants in, there's also more leaf, more, which is great for all of the other insects to enjoy as well. Try and plant mainly in sun because except for bumblebees, bees do not like to forage in shade. Plant in blocks. I do it because I'm counting bees, but actually it's more efficient for bees to go from one plant to another, uh, one flower to another without wasting uh, journey time and energy. So plant in blocks. Leave things untidy over winter. Please don't dig your compost bins, for instance, for bumblebees tend to nest in them over winter and add some accommodation for your solitary bees. All of that, and there you go. So those of you with gardens, I would now encourage you when the wind dies down a bit on a nice mild sunny day, I'd encourage you to go around your garden and really pay attention to what is attracting bees and what is not, and give consideration to whether you want to have plants in your garden that might be pretty but not providing any food or might be fantastic but only flower for two or three weeks maybe you can substitute it for a plant that flowers for a longer time providing more bee food a quick plug for our product rosy bee cells um, only online and we send our plants out in boxes that look like that we sell in trays of six to try and encourage people to put in a nice old clump and those are my website and contact details. Tony, back to you. That was great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, <laughs> a lot of uh, interesting stuff to take, to think about, I think, and to take back with us. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, da -da 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 -da. Does anybody have a direct question before I start going through the group chat? Uh, Lou, uh, I've got Lewis, but it doesn't look like a Lewis. <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. I'll just unmute you. I can't unmute you for some reason. Have you managed to get... That's it, you're unmuted. Now. Okay, yes. Sorry, it's Julie Burke. Um, I was very surprised that Green Alcanet was not shown on the lists. That is my top garden plant for bees. Um, well, the emphasis is on the word garden. And um, there are a couple of plants which I've sort of toyed with including. But where I've tried native plants, I've tried to only include plants that I felt were not going to be regretted by gardeners if they put them in their garden. If you can imagine someone putting green alkanet into a small town garden, within three years, they really wouldn't have anything else growing there. So that's why I'm a little nervous of putting the really, really tough wild plants in, although I don't dispute what you say. Um, I personally haven't been able to get either alkanet or the other one um, for consideration is comfrey to um, grow on my heavy soil. So I would like to do a count on them if anybody felt the next, you know, has a patch of alkanet or um, comfrey and feels um, they'd like to count bees on a square meter of them for the next three years and send me the data, that would be absolutely fantastic. But I haven't been able to do it 
but I, like I said, I am a little nervous about them as garden plants. Well, it's interesting. A lot of your results are contrary to mine. I, I did have some calamint and I didn't have a single bee on it. And then, and then it died. So, but I'm not going to try again. And that may be a case of it, the plant wasn't happy in your soil conditions. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I tend to agree with the, the comments about the green alkanet. Um, my garden is predominantly green alkanet. I'm just be trying to fight it off. Um, it is so invasive. But in terms of bee numbers, particularly in the spring, um, my alkanet is actually covered in hairy footed flower bee anthophora. They absolutely love it. And as you, Rosie, you mentioned earlier on, it flowers very early and is therefore really, really useful as, as an early spring flower. The problem I have with it at the moment, it becomes very, very leggy, it starts to collapse everywhere, and then big open patches uh, arise of, of rotting uh, vegetation, which is a bit awkward. And I've been trying to replant the garden uh, in competition with green alkanet, and that is really hard. So any advice on that would be very useful. <laughs> Well, mine just dies back. I leave it to flower. The garden is covered with it. It dies back in time for other flowers to take over. Mm. It's, to me, it's not a problem. No, it's, I, I have to say the same thing. So, but it is, it's an excellent plant, if it, but it's a shame it is so invasive. Okay, are there any other questions? If we have a hand up, I can't see anything at the moment. If you either wave your hand in the air or raise your hand, then I can see. There's nobody at the moment. Um, no, somebody's Hello. Hello, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, it's Liz from Bradford on Avon in Wiltshire. Um, we have a lot of blue campanula in our garden. It just seems to self seed everywhere and it's always covered in bumblebees. It's really lovely. And I even let it grow around the rotary clothesline on the ground and in the corners because it does attract so many bees and it has a very long flowering season. Is that typical all around the country or is it just in this part of the country? Do you know which campanula it is? Um, it's got sort of like, it starts off with small bell shaped flowers and then it opens up to stars. Is it, a low, is it a low growing creeping one? It's a trailing one. It grows yes. on a high, um, yeah, on top of a wall, which is sort of waist height and it trails down in the sort of V shapes. Um, yes, I know the one. That, that campanula is, is more attractive to the bumblebees. Other campanulas attract solitary bees. In fact, there is a small solitary bee um, that is specialises in campanulas. Right, but it's They're such a pretty bumblebee. plant to grow. And we do have a natural bees nest in our dry stone wall. And mostly bumblebees of different descriptions go in it. Lovely. Now, companions are wonderful. I planted them in, in my garden for the first time this year, and almost immediately I attracted Kiva stoma, that's the scissor bee you were referring to, and suddenly they appear from nowhere. I've never had them in the garden before, and it's, it's impressive how quickly new plants are colonised in certain areas. You don't know until you try. So it's, it's a really exciting project to get involved in if you wanted to, to try and do these meter plantings. Um, I've been a bit influenced by Rosie and actually did that before I've actually spoken to her. And it does seem to have worked really well. So this is kind of a commercial endorsement, I suppose, but shouldn't be doing oh, I'm that. delighted. I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, um, moving on. Um, uh, I've got a question. Yes, Janice. Great, thank you. Um, I always assumed that I had foliage growing in the garden. I'm just wondering, is that antimonts? Excuse my ignorance. I don't. Are, are they very similar plants? Sorry, can I? I wasn't quite sure. I heard. Were you asking if borage oh, um, was similar to yeah. alkanet? Yeah, we we let um, borage grow in the garden for the the bees. You yes. know, a, a patch of it. Um, but it's very invasive, and the roots go down and everything. And I'm just wondering, is that alkanite, not borage? Uh, um, it doesn't sound like borage. Borage is not, borage self-seeds itself around everywhere, but is an annual and is very easy to simply pull out. And yes, it's usually dropped as seeds, so you'll get more next year. But if you've got something with long roots going down, it does sound to me like you may have alkanet or comfrey, not borage, but they are members of the same family. 
Right, and just one more question <laughs> is that we occasionally have the campanula growing in the garden because it sells seeds. Um, and it's a beautiful plant, so I've been trying to grow it from seed. Um, I'm on my second packet of seed. It very seems to be very difficult to actually germinate. So, has anyone got some guesses? Um, I, I think, if I may, um, two things. Firstly, um, only don't cover it. Sprinkle the sprinkle it on the surface of damp compost and press it in, and then keep it in shady, warm conditions until it germinates. Secondly. You're better collecting the seed from plants and sowing it virtually green. So as soon as the seed bed opens and produces seed dry enough to tumble out, it grows much better from fresh seed than it does from any packets. Things that seed sellers don't sell don't tell you, of course. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from the floor? Otherwise, I'll start working through the uh, group chat. Um, so. Working through from top to bottom, some are relevant to Rosie, some not so. Um, Celia's asking about a bee in her garden being grey and black. There are the ashy mining bee is the typical grey and black bee, but that's a spring bee, it's not around so much at the moment. There are a few others, and I think um, Rosie mentioned sharp tailed bee, which is a black and white bee, but they're quite rare or it's not rare, infrequently seen. They're associated with um, bees that nest in, in uh, tubes and solitary bee houses and so on. Um, also bees at this time of year start, particularly bumblebees, are starting to get a bit bit warm and so they start to, and bleached as well with the sun that we've had so they start to look quite odd. So it's always good to get a picture of these bees if you can and then post them on the, the Bee Wars Facebook site which I put in the beginning of the chat and see if someone can recognise them. Uh, working my way down, do interrupt me if you want to. Um, as a question from Janice. Uh, all right, that's that's about wild monster. It's a good point, actually. Janice, do you want to say something about the wild monster project? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a scheme that was um, set up, and I live in South Woodford, so it's a, you know spread um, around monsters in South Woodford. But the idea is that in the tree pits, we sow wild flowers and. Um, to attract you know the bees and the insects and ultimately birds and I've seen goldfinches you know landing in our tree pits so you know it's, it's a really great scheme and you know sadly a lot of the people around this way they um, pave over their front gardens so you know it is a shame and we're trying to actually increase um, the area and down my road we're lucky enough we've got like a huge grass surge and um, I have actually asked whether or not we can sow that, you know, with wild um, uh, seed for the, the uh, bees and the birds and the butterflies. And um, the council actually looking into the scheme at the moment, but there was a slightly ambiguous reply saying that they, they are expanding the areas. But one of their main problems is that when they don't cut grass for such a long time when they do cut it then then left with a lot of grass to um, dispose of so I was just wondering is, is there a way to convince uh, them I mean is there you know something that people can suggest about you know disposing of all this large amounts of grass that's a, that's a big question actually does anybody have any ideas on disposing of large amounts of grass cuttings on behalf of the council <laughs> Yeah, it's the trouble is, I suppose, in terms of haymaking, it's probably not great for, for animals either, in the sense most of these places be quite polluted, I suspect. Mm -hmm. um, but interesting topic for discussion later on. Thanks, Janice. Yeah. Um, I mentioned in the chat that there's a talk about dung beetles dying out, and there's been quite a lot of research on this, and it's thought that that has a lot to do with the use of insecticides and acaricides used mm -hmm. in for treating animals for parasites. Um, so do have a look at the article from Bristol University, which I put into the chat if you're interested in that. Um, Celia has a question. Would the results of the study vary much with different regions, Rosie? 
I think they will vary a bit. Um, I tried to get some volunteers involved in doing some copycat research in different parts of the country, unfortunately a little unsuccessfully, but I did get one lady who managed to, she, she actually had some of my plants and she had some others that were very similar. So we had sort of mm, six or eight plants in common and she counted religiously right over one summer. And there was more, things that were in common than there were differences. But I think it comes back to in a, a peaty acid soil, then some plants are going to behave much more, uh, much, uh, more differently than um, uh, they will in uh, limey soil. So I think it will be, there are differences, but there'll be a differences to plant health and that will have the knock on effect on the bees. I would love, um, someone else to do it and uh, we have dreams of moving to Wales and when if I get to Wales then I will be very interested to repeat my study in Wales in completely different conditions and then I can answer that question properly. Interesting the next question was would it be different in the north in Wales so <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, my new best friend who was it? <laughs> and the other thing to bear in mind is that there is actually a POMS count, the pollinator monitoring scheme that's running in the UK at the moment. Uh, we have a link to that on our website and it might be worth sort of thinking about these fit counts, the flowering insects, time counts and seeing how these map together with your work, Rosie. Yes. Um, indeed, whether or not we can, I mean, certainly I'm looking at doing some work with some others in looking at foraging habits of bees in London. Um, so there might be some synergy there between various groups. It's just a question of getting people together to do it. So if you want to volunteer and finding a way of getting people together to talk about it, um, I shall have a think about that and possibly put something up on the website if anybody's interested in getting involved. And I'll talk to Rosie afterwards as well. Um, Ed, Edward, Edward actually asked, do you, Edward, do you want to clarify your question, please? I asked the question early on in the presentation and later on she paid more attention to the wild bee. <laughs> I think it is fine. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Um, Janice again, do cornflowers, field poppies and California poppies attract bees and insects? I'm afraid I can only answer so, uh, properly for the plants that I have studied. Um, I, I think when you see the um, seed mixes that are sold, anything that you're putting out that is growing from seed is going to be a viable plant and is going to produce pollen and nectar and therefore will be beneficial for, uh, for um, pollinating insects. How beneficial, I can't actually quantify without having studied it. I also think that the sort of seed mixes um, are quite difficult to get established. Um, you have to have done quite a lot of work to have reduced the grass content or other weed content in your soil to get the real benefit from. If you're doing it as a square meter in your garden, you can probably control it very well. But if you're doing it on any kind of scale, um, it's, it is difficult and a lot of people have found this, so I just put that health warning out there. I mean, my garden, um, poppies in particular, have a slight problem. Most of the bees that use poppies need to be able to so-called buzz pollinate to release the pollen. So if they can't do that, they tend to avoid using poppies. So they're very, very good for bumblebees in particular. They just love poppies. But the other problem with poppies, of course, is that they flower in the morning and they're gone by uh, um, midday so you have to be up early to catch the bees on those um, uh, Philip has a question do you want to ask it Philip or do you want me to read it out I'll put it in context um, you talked about honeybees turning up mob handed uh, while well, they do communicate good sources of, of nectar and pollen is there any evidence that bumblebees or other groups do the same thing? Uh, no, I think you're right. It's just that honeybees are highly sophisticated and do communicate and do work in teams. I do not believe there is any evidence that even though bumblebees live in colonies, that they go back and tell the others 
um, where the food is. When you observe bumblebees foraging, they very much do as it says in the name and bumble around and go from plant to plant. A bumblebee will quite happily go from uh, a scabious onto an echium onto something else all in one foraging trip as it tours around where honeybees will come and load up on a single plant and go back yeah okay thanks um, I, i'm conscious of the fact we're now out of time but i'm happy to carry on if rosie wants to carry on i'm all right for another few minutes okay so we'll, we'll carry on. Um, I'm just a quick comment on the bees one of the things that we've noticed also in terms of competition is of course that honeybees and bumblebees are out early in the morning and so by the time the most solitary bees are up and about already the nectaries have been raided so they do suffer quite a bit from the competition from these larger bees because that's related to the fact that they're able bumblebees and honeybees are much better able to thermoregulate they're able to control their body temperatures whereas most solitary bees are very dependent on weather and particularly those that don't have fur or hair or pile. So some of those that, um, like the, some of the uh, smaller oil bees and so on, uh, don't have hair. So they're very, very susceptible to cold weather. Um, Edward, has that been answered? Did you study non-native plants like Impatiens glandif 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 glandifera? Does that make sense to you? Uh, Edward? No, go on, Rosie. Um, I, about 75% of the plants I have studied have actually been non-native. I had to make myself go and find native plants that were going to be safe to put in a garden. And uh, I now do include um, quite a few of those in my plant range because I do think they're good, particularly knapweeds, which um, as an example. Um, so... I haven't studied that particular plant that he mentions, but I have in no way um, restricted myself to native um, to non-native uh, or native plants. Just gone with what goods for bee, what's good for bees. Super. This is the Himalayan balsam. It's an invasive plant, but it's very popular with the bumblebees and bees. Um, okay. I think I'm a little worried about the word invasive. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think Himalayan balsam fits in with you know, Japanese knotweed at the moment. Don't plant it, whatever you do. <laughs> um, where we are with the canals around here, the banks are actually you know full of it. And to be honest, I'm really disappointed. I don't see heavy bee populations on Himalayan balsam, you know, even even in our local area. Bumblebees will use them, but not in great numbers. Not that I've got any data. That's a bit impressionistic. Um, Moira says that she's heard that some plants can renew their nectaries very quickly. Do you have information about other plants that can do this? Um, I know that all of the members of the Boraginaceae family, which is the Borage, the Arcanet, the countries that we've already mentioned, that is true that they are the ones that are meant to be the quickest on renewing their nectar, so that they're really providing nectar all day, unless it's in very dry weather conditions, where others definitely um, are once, once a day, once in the morning, or sometimes they don't even produce it till the afternoon, to presumably just to give themselves a competitive edge. But the Boraginaceae, all of them, excellent for that. That's a good point, actually. Good, good thing to think about when planting out the beds to make sure yeah, you've got a good, I... good spread. Moira? Yeah, I, I sort of knew about the borage related plants, but I'm just wondering if there were any others, um, any research done on it, any other species of plant. I don't have data on that, okay, sorry. That's fine. Thanks. Okay, uh, just some questions. So, Ben, Ben, are you there? Uh, I am, yes. Hi, Tony. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Do you want to, do you want to answer, ask that question then? It was basically answered in the, the previous oh, question. Right. I was just wondering whether the the amount of nectar that the plant produces and, and how quickly it refreshes that nectar source is an important factor in, in what you should plant. And funnily, funnily enough, uh, I did read a paper on how Himalayan balsam produces very high amounts of nectar and it, it re refreshes this quite quickly. Um, and it sort of framed this argument that not all non-natives should be considered bad as such we should maybe think about their functionality rather than their, you know, nativeness. Um, <laughs> I agree. But, uh, yeah, I, I just wondered whether 
in your study, uh, you'd actually factored this in? Um, I haven't, other than looking at what's native and non-native, I haven't looked at nectar production because I've just been guided by the bees. So logically a plant that's attracting a lot of bees is doing so because it has continuous food. Mm -hmm. And do they, but I assume they would go to a plant whether it has nectar or not, whether, whether the nectar has been exhausted or not before they move on to the next plant. I'm only counting ones that are actively foraging. So if they're going and then, you know, biz buzzing off again incredibly quickly, I wouldn't have counted it. Right, okay. Bear in mind that foraging is, has two purposes. One is nectar, which particularly for bees is, is generating energy in the case of most solitary bees and bumblebees. Um, and then pollen, of course, for feeding the grubs. So there'll be two different patterns in play. Mm -hmm. But thanks for that, Ben. If you can post that paper on the chat, that'd be great. So I'd be interested in that. And I'll go and have another look at Balsam. To see, see, <laughs> I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks. Um, Kathy Baker's asked about ragwort. We have so much in our fields, we're gradually digging it up because we have animals, but the bees love it. Any comments on ragwort? I have comments on ragwort. I think it's absolutely vital if you want to have cinnabar wasps in this country. Um, I haven't observed bees on ragwort, so that's very interesting. We mainly observe, we have a little bit of it in our field. Um, we mainly observe hoverflies and butterflies on the ragwort, so that is interesting. I think we have a little bit more ragwort this year, so maybe it liked the damp conditions. So as that begins to come into flower now, um, I will pay attention to that. So thank you for the tip. Um, obviously, people dig it out because they believe it's poisonous to animals. It's bad for horses. It's not very serious for other animals unless they eat an awful lot of it. And even the extent of the damage to horses, I believe, was based on some very bad science. Well, that's an interesting, controversial, I had to look into that. A quick comment from my own observations on ragwort. Colletese bees love it, and so do um, green-eyed flower bees, the um, Anthophora bimaculata. Again, very, very popular with those two bee species. So definitely worth looking at ragwort. It's good for attracting some of the, the more, more unusual and less common bees as well. Thank you. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, from Annette, my soil is clay. The comfrey is transformed to a low growing plant, but still attractive. I'm not quite sure. Was there a, <laughs> was there a question associated with that? I don't think so. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> Ron and Pat want to ask a question, I think. Go for it. Yes. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about feeding bees and what they like to eat and take away. Can we do anything about their nesting sites and um, their homes? So, you know, can we provide them, improve them? And I'm thinking not of honeybees, I'm thinking of the wilder bees. Thank you, great question. Uh, a lot of the solitary bee um, hotels and nests that you can buy are excellent. Um, I strongly recommend, and maybe I'll link it to the chat afterwards, um, the type which you can dismantle and clean. Top tip on solitary bee houses is that solitary bees, um, a lot of the red mason bees don't like to reuse tubes. So if you buy one and then stick it in a corner and ignore it for years and wonder why it's not being used, it's because it's probably got full of spiders and other things and they don't like it so you do have to clean them out on an annual basis and then you will get a lot more use of them if you've got the type that can be completely dismantled and then you can actually remove the uh the little um, bee cocoons from inside um and then release them again in spring that increases um the likelihood of them surviving winter even more and things like if you follow kate bradbury she's got quite a lot of information about how you can do that as a wildlife gardening writer um as for bumblebee nesting i'm not aware of how you can improve that other than not digging your compost bins, which is a favorite place for some of them to be nesting. Um, the wild bees, well, um, other than giving them solitary bee nests, um, most of them just have to fend for themselves. So no use of pesticides will help. And 
whether you've got bare patches of soil somewhere, that can also help some ground nesting bees. So yes, although it's also good to leave your grass to grow along, then conversely, there are some solitary bees that would be much happier if you kept your grass very short so they can get to the soil underneath it. Different bees, lots of different situations. Sorry, don't, not sure if that was helpful. I think, I think the other thing is look at the bees that are visiting your plants and then choose the potential habitats for those, particularly for solitary bees. It's a bit like the Campanula. I've got Aquila stoma present, but then I've got lots of potential nest sites. They'll nest in cracks and crevices, in stems of old grasses, um, old brambles. When brambles die back, there are a whole bunch of bees that will nest inside the dead stems of brambles. So we're all ca careful to clear these things away, but actually they provide fantastic habitats for a variety of bees. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jackie. Um, uh, into, but one thing to be Sorry. wary of, and it's something we're doing, about to start doing some work on at the moment, is there's a tendency to try and create these huge bee hotels with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, nesting sites. That's brilliant initially, but they attract equally, which is fun for me because I love it, they attract the collector parasites and the parasites. I mean, we have another type of wasp called Sapiga quinqui punctata, for example, which... Uh, lays its eggs uh, or larvae in uh, some of our, our tube nesting bees which is fantastic to see so you may well take out the cocoons and and particularly for the red mining bee for example uh, and then you'll suddenly find you've, you've hatched out loads of wasps instead of bees so do be very careful try and space stuff around we don't quite know what the optimum spacing in a lot of the solitary bees are not very good at choosing the appropriate places for them to nest and they do open themselves up um, to higher burdens of parasitism, kleptoparasitism, parasitism, and also mite infestations as well. Mostly phoretic, they travel around and, and feed on the detritus inside the bee hotels. But nonetheless, if you get too many of them, they can actually start to eat into the winter food supplies for the grubs and therefore they won't survive. Or you'll end up with lots of very small bees. Remember, the size of bees is depend on how well fed they are. So the less food they have, the smaller the bees are, the less likely they are to be successful. I'm talking too much. Let's talk about um, who else have I got? Everybody say what a wonderful talk it is, which is fantastic. Uh, a question from Annette or Janice. Was that the question about Campanula growing from seed? I think it was. Clover in the lawn is supposed to be great for bumbles. Is it worth introducing into the lawn and how? Clover in the lawn is great for bumbles, especially if you set your mower on its highest possible setting so you don't take the flowers off so much. However, introducing it into a, an, an established lawn is very difficult. The only way you really do it is through plug plants. So growing clover in plugs is completely possible. You just buy some seed and grow it in sort of little cells um, and then pop them in. But you will have to clear a little bit of the grass to give the clover a chance to get its feet in for the first few weeks. Yeah, I've got lots of clover in my lawn, which, and I haven't mown the lawn, which is causing much angst in the household. Um, and I've got five species of solitary bee, plus the bumblebees, plus the honeybees on it. It's absolutely fantastic. I love it. I can't walk on my garden, though. That's the thing, in bare feet. Although the, the solitary bees won't sting, but the, the, the honeybees and the bumbles definitely will, um, if you tread on them. Uh, and Jackie's asked a similar question. How would you suggest we look after lawns to be bee-friendly? I think you've kind of answered that, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um... No, I think that uh, I'm not a great believer in this letting your grass grow long thing. I would rather have, it's just my personal taste and everyone to their own, I would rather have a flower border stuffed full of flowers so that you get maximum pollen and nectar from the space and then let my lawn grow sort of three or four inches long so I've got the shorter flowering plants <clears throat> that are, can come through it. Um, but I'm happy to have wild spaces, but I don't necessarily want the whole of the garden turning into a wild space. Um, and so that's my, my preference. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, Janice asks if you sell seed on your website. A quick plug for your... Uh... I don't sell seed at all, just plants, sorry. Okay. Um, blah, 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 still going through. Lots of chat. Uh, somebody's asked if the uh, this is this has been recorded. It's still being recorded, and I'll make that available from the website. If I uh, if I can get a local allotment to divide up into one square meters, when is the best time of year to plant seed or plugs for the next year's wild pollinators? That's a good question. Any time where you can provide the pl plants with enough water to get established, it really doesn't matter. So typically. July and August are probably the worst times to do it towards the end of August. However, I think this July is proving that it's not going to be too dry, so you're all right. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, still, so if anyone's got any questions, do ask them. I think that can, can I just ask about yeah. adding wildflowers to a lawn? You would suggest, Rosie, that plug plants are going to be much better than seed if I'm trying to convert a lawn to a meadow. Um, definitely. Seed is highly unlikely to germinate in an established lawn. The grass will simply outcompete it when the plants are small. So you need to put the plant in as a reasonable size. OK, well, I think that's just about exhausted everything so far. Rosie, that was really interesting. Thank you very much indeed for this talk. Uh, and thank you. And thank you, everybody else, for listening, to contributing, for all the questions. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think Ben's still with us. He'll be talking next week on reptiles. Do you want to do a plug for your talk, Ben, at all? Um, I think, well, I think you did a good job with the uh, description. It's just going to be a short piece on sort of how to identify the common or widespread reptiles that you might find in, in your area uh, and a little bit on how to survey for them. That's the trick with reptiles. There aren't many of them, so you don't need to know a huge deal on how to ID them. But you do need to be a little bit tricky when it comes to finding them and learning about where to find them. Brilliant. So that's what we'll be covering. Okay, thanks so much, Ben. So that's next week, same time, same place. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. If Rosie wants to hang on at the end and some of the club committee members, that'd be great. Thank you very much indeed and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Danny and Rosie. Well, Stuffy, thank you, Rosie. <laughs> Excellent. Hi. Okay, Hi. bye, everyone. Yeah. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you.